Hello. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm Kathy Sebring. I'm the program coordinator for the Norfolk Council on Aging. And I'm very pleased to present C. McKinney, who is doing our wonderful program, Genealogy Getting Started. Seema is currently the president of the Massachusetts Association or Society of Genealogists. And um, she's got lots of expertise and we're all waiting eagerly to hear about it. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. This is being recorded. If you do not want your face to be seen, then I suggest that you can um, block your video. And if anyone, um, I, this may be shown on Norfolk Cable Television. So um, if you're okay having your picture here, then please proceed. Okay, thank you. And Seema? Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to do this um, presentation. And to those of you who showed up, nice to see you. I can't see all your faces, but I can see a few looking back at me, which is always good. Um, I'm sure like you, I'm, or like me, you're missing some of this, you know, being in person and having a conversation about this. So we'll try to do it as, as friendly and leisurely as we possibly can to make sure everybody can participate. Um, so I am the president, as Kathy said, of the Massachusetts Society of Genealogy. Um, I'm just starting my second term um, and my last. Ten years as an officer is way too much for one person. Um, <laughs> But I'm also involved in planning our New England Regional Conference, which happens every two years. Um, that's done by the New England Regional Genealogical Council, otherwise abbreviated NERGC, um, which is the name of our website. And that's coming up in a couple of months, actually. Um, a nice big virtual conference with 72 uh, lectures for people to listen to over the course of two months. So um, this is for getting started. That doesn't mean that you're all beginners by any means, because I've had people walk into this talk who've been researching for 20 years. Not quite sure what they ever learned from me going out, but they don't seem disappointed. So I guess I, it's their, their issue, not mine. Um, so we're going to look at starting your genealogy. Um, and we're going to do that by looking at two of the most common forms that are used in genealogy. And then we'll talk a little bit about the places and things that you might research for. And of course, because I'm big on education, I have to give you some other places where you might do some more self-education about genealogy, because Lord knows there are plenty of places to do that. So we're going to start out like any good topic. We have to start with a definition of what we're doing. So genealogy is all about studying families, not just in a genetic context, which is, of course, what we maybe immediately think of. We want parents, grandparents, um, but also in a historical context so that we can understand a little more about how these people lived and maybe why they did certain things. Um, some of the pulls and pushes in their lifestyles. Um, of course, genetic family, every person can define that the way they want. If you have adoptions and things, um, you know, you can define your family the way that it suits you. Just be clear when you're sharing it with other people, whether you're a direct blood descendant and therefore a genetic descendant of someone, or if it is a more emotional connection. Um, because you don't wanna send somebody else on a, chasing down a path that's in error. So we are gonna look at the people who compose a family, not just the parents and grandparents, but also all the siblings, which become aunts, uncles, and cousins. And of course, in many cases, we're gonna be working on a biography because we have to sort each person out to make sure we're really looking at the right person. And of course, in every genealogy, you will hear something about John Smith because that's gotta be the worst name to have to you know, research in the United States. There's thousands of them and of course if it's in your tree you want to make sure you get the right John Smith. Insert any other name you want from an, any ethnicity because every ethnicity has a very common name like that. Maybe even several. 
So why are we getting started and why are we doing this? Well, there's probably as many reasons to do this as there are people that have engaged in the hobby over time. For many of us, it's just a curiosity. We just need to know. Um, there's no real explanation. We just feel it in our bones. We need to know this stuff. Um, many people do this to get their medical history. Certainly very valid for all those forms you have to do at the doctor's office. Um, maybe you've got a family lore, a family story that you just need to research and find out if, you know, was grandma really telling the truth about so-and-so or how you're related to a famous person. Some of us want fancy things to put on our walls. My husband has accommodated many of those in our house. Um, perhaps we need to look for heirs or we're hoping to be an heir or an heiress and find that rich person who left us something that we didn't know about. Um, and sometimes it's just a document that gets you started or a picture that you've always seen on the family wall and just really didn't know much about. <clears throat> the reason isn't important, the getting started is important. So the most common form to use in genealogy is a pedigree chart. And this will look familiar to you, any of you that have filled out a baby book for a child or a grandchild or had your, seen your own baby book, you've probably seen one of these, maybe even as a school assignment. A pedigree chart starts with what we call as the focus person. This is the person that we're researching. So it could be you, it could be a child, but it could be a grandchild of yours. Um, that's totally up to you. It could be your parent if you wanna start with them. From that focus person, we write into the pedigree chart, the father and the mother. And by the way, I should have mentioned, um, I gave you two of these blank pedigree charts in your handout, which I hope everybody got a copy of. Um, one so you can take notes on today and one so you'll keep it, you can have it as a blank and you're welcome to make as many copies and things as you want to start filling them out. Because one of the nicest things about genealogy is you don't have to buy anything to get started. You just need paper and pencil. And most of us have enough of that around the house somewhere that we can get started. So we've so far got two generations here, assuming we can fill in both mom and dad's date names. And then the third generation would be our grandparents. And we refer to one set as paternal, the other as maternal, depending on which parent they are parents for. And then typically on the same page, we would put in the eight great grandparents. Again, assuming we know who they are. And I've color coded this pink and blue for obvious reasons, just to keep track of who's who. So if you look at it, you'll notice that the blues are always on the top. So the men are always on the top line of a couple, the women are on the bottom line. And if you look further, you might discover if you stared at it long enough, um, all the men, and this doesn't include the focus person, but all the men have even numbers and all the women have odd numbers. Now this doesn't seem so important as you're writing down the ones that you know, but when you find one of these scribbled on a piece of paper in a library somewhere and the names are not all John, Mary, Susan, and Mark, which are a little more easy to determine male and female, um, it becomes important to understand the placement of the names so that you can figure out is Hepzibah a male name or a female name? It's a female name, but you know, not every name is obvious where it belongs in the cycle. On your blank form, you're also going to notice that underneath people's names, there are initials. Um, typically, there'll be the initials B, M, and D, and these stand for birth, marriage, and death. These are considered our vital statistics. This is the information that at a minimum, we should try to get for each person. And I say at a minimum because this does allow you to make sure, again, that you have the right John Brown. I want the John Brown who was born on this date in this town. You know, each of these has two components. It has a date and it has a place. Underneath the women of a married couple, we don't typically put a marriage date because we figure they married their husband and they got married on the same date. And, you know, people make enough transcription errors. We don't need to compound it by giving them places to enter the same data more than once. So this is a pretty typical pedigree chart. It fits on an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, which is nice because it's easy to carry around with you. 
Um, most computer software, if you're using a computer to type this information in, will generate this for you, so you don't have to worry about hand, filling it out by hand. But most of us may hope that we go back a little further than the four generations, especially if you are already in generation three or four because you're doing this for one of your descendants. So you will find that most pedigree charts are going to have a place on them, and I just put this one up in the left-hand corner there, um, a place for a chart number. In this case, starting with my focus person, this would be chart number one. And most charts will also have a place down usually towards the bottom that will say person number one on this chart is the same person as person blank on chart blank. Now on the first chart, you don't need to fill that statement in at the bottom at all because this is chart number one. However, if we start a second chart, because we've learned something about the fifth, sixth, seventh, or eighth generation here, we would end up filling that in. Here I've created two charts, okay? Chart number one is in green, chart number two is in blue. And on chart number two at the bottom, I would fill in that statement to say person number one on this chart is the same as person number eight on chart number one. And that allows me to link these charts all together Usually if I'm in a library or something, I'll say, you know, this is when you ask to use the room so you can come in and lay all your charts out and see how everything fits together. Um, because obviously adding eight more charts to that first one, it's gonna take up a lot of room and try to lay them out. So hopefully this is somewhat clear as mud, I'm sure, at least as strong coffee until you start working on it. So you can have as many of these pedi pedigree charts as you need. If you're, again, if you're doing it on a computer, it all becomes automatic and you don't have to necessarily worry about how these match up. But when you hit a library or a historical society or anything like that to do some research and you find these, they're going to be handwritten. They're going to be a little scratchy. Not all the boxes are going to line up nice and even like this. Some of the things are going to be, you know, how great grandma wrote have to use every inch of the paper and all of that. Um, so having a good idea of what the format looks like is a bonus as you start to do some more research. Starting out with a blank one is a great way for you to get started. Fill in what you know, and that will help to tell you what you need to research. So the second chart that we use for genealogy is called a family group sheet. And this is the one that fills in the places, the people that don't fit on a pedigree chart. If we look at this, if I back up and we look at this pedigree chart, you notice that there's no place for your siblings. There's no place for aunts and uncles or great aunts and uncles, cousins, anything like that, because they end up going on the family group sheet. Again, I've given you two of these in your handout, so if you wanna take notes on one, you. You'll still have a blank one afterwards for copies and filling in on your own. So a family group sheet usually starts out and it does have some grandparents' names at the top. Now that's usually just for your own peace of mind when you have these families, as I do, um, where father is named after, you know, the grandfather who's named after the great grandfather sometimes it can get a little confusing as to, wait, which page am I looking at? Which generation? So it helps to have a few extra names on there to just kind of keep them straight when you've got three or four men with the same name. Then we have on the next line, we have the father and mother's name and then columns for all the children. So if I was filling this out for my family, it would look like this. I just have my sister and I, so I don't really need all nine lines. Um, but I do have families, certainly in colonial New England, where I've needed a second sheet just to add all the children because there were 15, 16, 18 of them, um, you know, before television, before there were other things to do in life. Um, so this is an opportunity to list, again, all the siblings, and they could be siblings of an aunt and uncle, they could be siblings of your own parents, so, or they could be even siblings, um, children of, you know, your siblings. So they could be your nieces and nephews. 
if you did one of these family group sheets for every couple on a pedigree chart, you would need at least eight. Sometimes you're going to, you might even want more than that because you might want one for each of grandma's brothers and sisters and grandpa's brothers and sisters and who knows who else. Um, these are a great form for keeping people straight when you find an old time obituary. And I say old time because obituaries today do not have the same amounts of information as the older ones do. But in the older ones, especially, they would say, you know, survived by, and they'd give you a bunch of information. Unfortunately, most women were listed as Mrs. Charles Smith or, you know, whatever. So it doesn't always help you to figure out which one of the sisters married a Mr. Smith, but it's a clue. Um, but this is a great way to start organizing that family information so that you have a place where you can say, oh, here's the couple. Um, you know, mom and dad, and here's all their children. This is also a great way, if you're just getting started, this form is a great thing to share with the cousins, the aunts, the uncles, anybody that you want to know that you're doing genealogy and you need their help. Ask them to fill out this form. Who are your parents? Who are your children? More importantly, when and where were all your children born? You may know the day, you may not know the year, you may not know the place, you know, depending how much they've moved around, whatever. Um, who did they marry? You know, making sure you got all those. We're very good as a society at remembering people's first names, but not always remembering last names. So sometimes you may need to get a little help. By giving them this little form that just says, could you fill this out about your own family? You're not stretching their imagination. You're not asking them to remember anything too difficult, I hope. Um, but you get them involved and you also let them know that, you know, this is something you're interested and in, something that you plan to pursue. Because you never know what they have in their drawers that you might need for your family history. So let's take a look at some of the things that you might start to research and look for. Once you've got some forms started, you filled in a little bit about what you know, then you're going to realize and say, oh, I'm not sure I know where my mother or my grandmother was born or something. You're going to start to have a, an idea of what you need to look for. So some of the things we want to look for, we want to find documents, photographs, newspapers. We want to pull up some memories of family um, members and family events. We want to come up with some stories. So under documents, of course, we want to try to find the birth, marriage, and the death. These all happen to be old ones for my family from the state of Maine. Every state has documents. They're going to look a little different. Um, you are going to have to get used to the handwriting. Sometimes you're going to read several documents that have nothing to do with your family just because you're trying to figure out, was this letter an H? Was it an F? You know, you just need more experience with that person's handwriting. And sometimes like this old death record here, which says right at the top that it's a copy of a death record from 1807, you will notice they didn't copy over a whole lot of information. But they did give me the name and the date, which is better than nothing. At least they kept the real important stuff on there. I would have loved if they had also put in the name of his father and mother and all the other neat things in those blanks, but I'll settle for what I can find. Um, in addition to finding the records that were written by the state or at a state or county level, I may also want to be looking for things like, is there an old family Bible? And this is where it helps to know how many cousins there were and aunts and uncles and whatever, because you may have to figure out which family member got the family Bible. Usually the oldest child, but not always. And it doesn't matter because if the oldest child got it, but they're gone, you're going to have to figure out who got it after them. There's no guarantee that the family Bible will give you a lot of information, but every once in a while, you find a nice one, something like this, which my cousin was nice enough to share with me. Um, gorgeous picture from a family Bible or at least a page of a, a register. 
pretty sure she got it out of a Bible. Um, it lists the parents and all the children. I kind of question why they all look like they're kind of sort of printed in those first two columns. Um, either that or I want to meet the ancestor that had this beautiful handwriting. Um, the original, this got scanned in black and white, so you can't tell it, but the original tells me in the columns for married and died that this was written by different people because it's in different inks, it's in different colors. Um, so I can assume that some of this was updated fairly contemporaneously um, as things happened. It's not a solid record. It needs to be researched. I still need to make sure that I can find other records that confirm these dates. But it's a heck of a great start, especially for somebody who has, you know, 10 or 11 children here. Plus, it's just a beautiful document. So where are you going to look to find these things? Well, the first place to look is in your own house. And you may be thinking like, no, I know what's in my house. I, I don't think I have it. But you know, there's a box somewhere that you brought home from a parent or an aunt or an uncle that you maybe haven't you know, sorted through yet. There's things that got thrown in drawers that you've forgotten about. So definitely look around your own home. You may find invitations to a wedding. You may find birth announcements, newspaper articles that were shared with you, whether they were obituaries or um, anniversary announcements, wedding party um, announcements, you know, anything like that. Even just a, hey, we've moved card, you know, a new address card that we used to send out because people would send us things in the mail. Um, all of that becomes important for your family history because you are trying to discover where was this person at a certain time so that you can look for other documents. So certainly an address change card is a big part of that because it'll tell you, hey, as of this date, they moved somewhere. Even if it was just across town, that could mean they're in a different voting precinct. It could mean a lot of things, just the fact that they moved across the town. Ask those aunts, uncles, and cousins. Ask them what they have. Um, if you've given them the family group sheet, you could do that with an introductory letter that says, you know, hey, I'm interested. I've picked up this hobby. I'm, I'd be thrilled to see what kind of things you have. Um, and if they're not interested in keeping those things, maybe they end up in your lap. That's why I have so many bookshelves behind me. Because um, I'll take anything that people want to give me that relates to my family and store it forever till, uh, just to keep it. Historical societies can be a great place to get information. So can local libraries. Um, I know right now it's kind of hard. They may or may not be open and things like that, but you know, give it a try. Um, I know our library is doing an awful lot of things through email that they didn't used to do, but it's great. You can email them questions and whatever. So is our historical society. Um, town offices, if you find out where somebody was born, died, married, you know, Town offices is a good place to go and see if you can get an official record. Again, you may start out by email, but that's okay. At least you're working on it. Um, land records in Massachusetts, all our land records back to the 1600s are public record. They're all available online. So if you have an address, um, it's not always a direct line, but there are ways to look up the land records and get information about where was the property? Where did your ancestor live when they purchased it? How much did they pay for it? Who did they buy it from? Who did they sell it to? All kinds of interesting information that you can find from deeds and things. Um, once the courts are opened up a little more, probate records are a great way to find information about what things your um, ancestors had when they died um, and what things they gave to who. Oftentimes, it's the only way to find some names of their children is by the fact that they're listed in the will as sons and daughters. And usually it's the daughters, and a lot of times it has their married name as well. So those are great places to look. And of course, there's plenty of websites out there while we're stuck at home that we can use for research. So let's look a little more at researching some of these things. Um, so here's some more details. Um, historical societies may have photographs 
Um, they may have newspaper articles. We know they have local expertise. So if you're not sure what the town was like back when, it's a great place to ask questions. Um, libraries have yearbooks. Sometimes you'd be surprised how far back yearbooks actually go. Um, they may have town reports that show your ancestor, especially if they were in either end of the society for that town. If they were the very wealthy or the very poor, they're very likely to be listed in the town report. If they were a tradesperson, they may be in that town report because they may have done work for the town that they got paid for. And that's always an interesting little thing to find out about. Um, the assessor in town may help you out with some property ownership information. Um, treasurer or collector may have some tax bills that help you to, again, get more information about land or property, um, other property that was owned by your ancestors. When you look at land records, you can find not only the deeds, but you can find the mortgages. So did they borrow money? Who did they borrow it from? Did they pay it off on time? You can get that information out of land records as well. And probate records, even if your ancestor died without a will, you want to see if there's a record in probate because if, the, if they died owning any kind of, especially land, and didn't have a will, somebody had to go and do an inventory. And that can tell you more about an ancestor than probably any other document you'll ever find. Imagine if somebody had to walk in your house and make an inventory of every single item you own. Well, <laughs> they'd be busy. <laughs> That's why most of us are trying to clean out our houses, right? We have a lot of stuff. But there's a method. They have to have a method to how they do that. And typically it means they walked around the bottom floor then they went to the top floor, and then they did outbuildings. So if you're reading through an inventory, you can almost start to lay out the landscape of your ancestors' buildings and their home. So you'll know where the kitchen was versus where the bedrooms were and things like that. So it can be very fascinating information to have. So as you're researching, um, and even as you're just filling out your pedigree charts and your family group sheets, it's great to make notes of where did I find this information? Who did I talk to to get this information? You know, was it Aunt Elsie? Was it Aunt Mary? Was it Aunt Gertrude? I need to know who gave me the information. If it was done in an interview, I need to know the date. So I can maybe attest to the fact that Yes, Aunt Elsie told me this, and no, she was not on any medication. She was fully aware of her senses, and I totally trust what she told me, right? Because personally, I'm convinced that my, great my grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren, are going to think that everybody who lived in the early 21st century was on some kind of Alzheimer's drug and didn't have any, you know, right mind among them. Um, I want to make sure they know I, I knew what I was talking about or my source knew. Even if you look at a source and you find nothing, you know, make notes about, I looked at this source. Oh my gosh, they had so much stuff about the Anderson family, but nothing on the person I was looking for, Mr. George Albert Anderson. Huh, I've got long lists of that. Tons and tons of stuff on Anderson, nothing on George Albert. But <laughs> when I found out that George Albert didn't always use that name, and sometimes he went by Albert George, I had a list of things to go back to and now go see, well, was there an Albert George listed among all those Andersons? Because maybe that was great grandpa. I can't explain why he changed his name depending on where he lived, but I found out that he did it, and that gives me a chance to go look for other information assuming I know where I started. Um, so whether it's a website, a book, a, a repository, whatever, it's a great idea to keep track of what did I look for, what did I find, when did I look for it, um, you know, and include the nicknames and make sure you know if you're looking for George, did you try G-E-O because that's a common abbreviation for George. Um, you know, if you're looking for Mary, there's probably 25 nicknames you might also need to look under. Elizabeth, did you try Beth? Did you try Eliza? Did you try Liz? Did you try Betty? 
all those things come into play up until you know exactly what kind of nicknames the people used for themselves. And most of the time, what you're going to find is a clue that tells you to go look somewhere else. And that's okay, too, as long as we remember where we first got the clue from and, and why it sent us to another place. So for websites, right, everybody's got websites these days. So it's not just the pay sites. There's lots of free sites we can look at. Um, again, if we're stuck at home, as many of us still are for quite a while. We've got websites for historical societies, the state archives, which have a lot of documents you may be interested in, um, Ellis Island, archives.gov is for the National um, Archives, now I, National Administration of Records and, no, National, I can't remember the, what it stands for, but NARA anyway. Um, our regional version of NARA is in Waltham, but they're still closed. I don't think they've opened since last March. Um, LOC.gov is the Library of Congress. They have a very large genealogical section. Um, lots of information that can be helpful for you right online. And then, of course, there's plenty of gene genealogical societies um, separated out both geographically and ethnically. So if you know for sure you're looking for a specific ethnicity, you might look up and see, you know, where is there an Italian or an Irish or a German focused genealogical society that might have some information for you. Many societies around the company, a country actually have libraries, so they do have a lot of resources to share. Others are simply more like clubs where people get together and meet and have speakers and things. So they may not have as much to share with you physically, but they may still have a lot of knowledge that you can draw on. And then, of course, we have the four big um, websites for family history. And the reason that FamilySearch.org is listed with a little space after it is because it is free. My favorite four letter F word. F-R-E-E, -E, familysearch.org. No money required. You do have to set up an account, but they do not ask for a credit card. They do not hand, hassle you to renew and pay more money or anything like that. Um, and it's a very large set of information. The other three, and I'm going to talk about all of these in a little more detail, are all pay sites. So you do have to get a subscription unless you can use Ancestry from your library in which case you want to know that you're not using the same ancestry as those of us that pay them a fortune every year to use their site. If you use the ancestry from a library, you're allowed to do research, but you are not allowed to build a tree. So you can go in and look at documents, you can get census reports, you can get military documents, but you can't store your information in ancestry the way somebody who has a subscription can. So let's look a little more at these four. So FamilySearch.org is run by the Mormons. If you're part of the um, Latter-day Saint Church, you have special access to things as a member of the church. They do have worldwide records. They have a, a very good um, selection of records covering the entire globe. And they are free. Best thing of all. Ancestry.com also has a relationship to the LDS Church, but it is a commercial site. It does have worldwide records. Um, they also have segmented records. So if you strictly want to do research in Canada, for instance, there's an Ancestry.ca for Canada, and you could check out a subscription to that, which might be less than getting the worldwide subscription from Ancestry.com. But it is subscription based. And even if you take their you know, initial trial, you just want to make sure with any of these that you cancel it before the date that they gave you so that they don't automatically charge your credit card, something that you weren't expecting. FindMyPast.com is another commercial site. Um, they do have a growing array of records, but they are a Great Britain company, so they concentrate on Great Britain. Great Britain is not the same as England, 
So it does include all of Great Britain. They have a lot of records for Australia, Ireland, Wales, England, Scotland. Um, and some of their biggest collections are also linked to libraries um, in the British Empire or what used to be the British Empire. Um, again, it is a subscription site, so there is payment involved and it's your decision, you know, which one of these you want to try out or which ones fit your budget. MyHeritage.com is kind of a newcomer, but it's still growing rapidly. Um, again, you can get all kinds of worldwide records. Now, most all of these have US records because they know that's their biggest market for people to join. So of course they're gonna get all the US records because they want all of us paying them money. Um, MyHeritage, however, is a European com company. So it does have a lot more ties to European records than some of the other ones do. Um, again, use the one that makes sense for the research you need to do. Um, there's no need to use all of them if that's not in your budget. Um, I don't know too many people that pay for all of these. Um, and if you do start, because all of these, um, if you're using them on your own, will allow you to build a tree. All of these use the same format for your tree file. So if you subscribe to Ancestry.com for a year and then decide, oh, well, next year I'm going to do my English, so I want to be at Find My Past. You can download your tree, export it from the website, and then import it to the next company so that you're not constantly having to re-enter everything. They're all the same file format. The only one you cannot do that with is FamilySearch.org. And that's because when you start to build a tree at FamilySearch, as soon as you put in an ancestor that other people have entered, so for instance, it happened to me when I entered my Revolutionary War ancestor, Barnabas Sawyer. As soon as I did that, it linked my tree to several other trees that also had Barnabas or his parents, whomever in it. And I can no longer take out just my portion of the tree. It is now connected because they're trying to create a one world tree. They want to document how everybody in the world is related. It's a very lofty goal, um, but my opinion, it got in my way. I couldn't get my stuff back out. Of course, every one of these, if you sign up for them, you're going to get on their mailing list. They're going to send you emails, usually telling you how many new records they've added, new great stuff you can access. Um, but pay attention because most of them also offer free weekends or free access to certain sets of records. I think the one that just got announced this week, I think it's my heritage that's doing um, free records to marriage, uh, free access to marriage records this weekend in honor of Valentine's Day. So you'll get different, you know, freebies, but you won't know about them unless you're on their mailing list. So even if you don't subscribe, it could be good to be on their mailing list. I've done that for years with the site for Swedish records um, because. When you get onto a site, especially in a foreign country, they tend to give you the freebies on the foreign country's holidays and not the holidays, you know, July 4th and Memorial Day when we're here trying to have barbecues and picnics. Um, I can't be at the picnic and also researching for the weekend. So it's nice to have a free weekend on something that's not an American holiday. So four big sites but there are certainly hundreds and hundreds of others out there for you to use as well um, as far as education continuing your education with this there are plenty of ways to do it um, there are I, I probably could name off at least 12 different societies just in massachusetts never mind throwing in rhode island and the rest of new england um, that can help out uh, there are libraries that have genealogy groups. Some are still meeting virtually, others are waiting to meet in person. Um, there are all kinds of seminars and presentations that are available. I mentioned earlier the NERGC conference, which is coming up in April. 
Um, we do that every other year, and we usually have about a thousand people there. So when it's in person, there's all kinds of opportunities to find New England cousins. Um, Eastman's online genealogy newsletter is a great place to get little tidbits. He kind of grabs little tidbits from the news all over the world and puts out a newsletter um, every day. Again, it's another mailing list, but that's okay. Um, Conference Keeper is a website that maintains lists of genealogy conferences, um, seminars, anything like that that's going on. And a lot of them are virtual now, so you have the advantage that you can attend from home, which is great. No travel, no hotels. I like that, saving money. Um, Legacy Family Tree offers free webinars every Wednesday. Um, they're open to, I believe it's the first 1,500 that get there. Um, you have to register in advance and they'll send you a link. They're then free for a week. After the one week, you have to have a membership in order to listen to the webinar again. Um, but you do have a full week to listen for free. Um, lots of conferences are currently live streaming. Roots Tech, which is the absolute biggest conference, um, is coming up in a couple of weeks and that's free this year because it's virtual. I think they said they already have close to 25,000 people signed up, maybe even more than that. So that could get kind of crazy, but it'll be worth checking out. Um, and of course, you've got educational things at the websites as well. Ancestry and Family Search, especially, have very large educational portions to them. So if you all of a sudden decide, you know, okay, I think I've got enough about grandma, but I don't know anything about her her land, her property, or grandpa's property or something, and you wanna just learn about property records. The nice thing about getting information at those websites is you can pick the topic and the time that you wanna get it. You know, if today's timing wasn't good for you, then you would have missed, as I'm sure, you know, maybe some people did, they missed this webinar. Um, they may be lucky if it ends up on cable, they still get to see it, but knowing at a certain time that you're interested in information is not always easy so looking on ancestry family search um, find my past even has a, a new educational thing um, where you can say i'm now interested in this topic and you can get the education at the time that's right for you family search even has a few um, I've, I've done a couple of them some of their little webinars can be as short as 10 minutes so it can just literally be I need to have a cup of tea and I'm just gonna listen to this. They have some, um, one that I've, one of these days when I get around to doing my German, I will sit and listen to, they have little webinars on foreign languages just to teach you the words that you might need in order to read a German document. Not every word in it, but enough to know, is this a birth, a christening, a baptism, a death? You know, it takes a little while to get the vocabulary down. So even something like that is a great benefit to be able to do when you need it. So before I open up for some questions, because if you run off and start to do some research this afternoon or tomorrow morning or whatever, there's a good chance that the first thing you're going to find is, or look for, is a census record. Because they're the easiest to find, right? The census is done publicly. Um, it's offered publicly once it's 72 years old. So I threw some information in here, and I don't think this is in your handout, so I'll leave the slide up as long as I need to. Um, we think of the census as being done every April 1st. It was not always done in April. Um, so if you're tracing somebody backwards in the census, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, they only aged nine years, or they aged 11 years, there's good reasons why. Always make sure you look at the top of the page to see what date the census was actually taken. Um, the most recent census that's available for research right now is the 1940. We have a little over a year to go before the 1951 gets published publicly. So it won't take you long. If you get back to the 1920 census, you can see that it was taken in January, 
whereas the 30 was taken in April. So there's going to be four months worth of people there, or three months worth of people that are going to be more than 10 years older between the two. And you just want to make sure you're understanding that that's, you know, perfectly legitimate and understandable. Um, if you get back and you're trying to find the 1890 census, I'm going to tell you to stop. Most of the 1890 census was destroyed in the War of 1812. So don't look for the needle in a haystack when the haystack doesn't exist, because it's hard enough to find it when the haystack does exist. So 1880 to 1900, we've got all kinds of other research issues to deal with that are way beyond an introduction. But I just want you to know that you shouldn't bang your head against the wall going, how come I can't find it? Because chances are it doesn't exist. There's very, very few parts of the 1890 that actually exist. So here is a 1940 census for my father's family. Uh, my father's actually the f on line 44 there, the fourth one down. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, this is a large blow up of it, but um, the, one of the things that came with the 1940 that's extra, you'll see that on the second line there, there's a little X inside of a circle next to my grandmother's name. That's to indicate that she's the one who answered the question. This is the first time that we're ever told who actually answered the question. So it's a big bonus to know, okay, now I know who answered. Grandma answered, great grandma answered, I get it. They answered the door because they were home. They talked to the census person. So you can see here, I get a lot of information as far as gender, race, age, um, marital status, where were they born, um, lots of, and a little bit of um, naturalization information there. My two great grandparents are listed as aliens. Um, this is only half of the page. So here's the other side of the page, continued on, where I get to learn a little bit more about whether people can read and write, what, um, what kind of industry they're involved in, and all kinds of little coded other information that we won't get into today, but just to let you know that, you know, this is what it's going to look like. You can see that there's a date at the top. It tells me who took the census. Um, and these can be great places because obviously if you didn't know who was in the family, you know, here we've got the whole family listed together and some idea of how they're related. So just remember and keep in mind that you are uncovering facts and they're not always from a society that has the same values or morals that you have today, but they're facts and we're not supposed to change the facts. We're supposed to just accept that, okay, life was different and that's how things went. Um, you know, yes, women were considered more property than they were person for a long time and it may or may not be what we think is right, but that's what it was and we have to deal with it. So I have here my website and my phone number. Um, I believe my email is on the handout. Please feel free to get in touch with me if you run into any snags that you need help with. I'm more than happy to help you at any time. And I'll open it up now for any questions that people have. Hi, I've got a question. This is John. Hi, John. Um, did a little research on the Ellis Island site, but it seems that um, my parents and their parents came through the Providence Immigration Center, and I can't find any information on that. Any hints there? Um, if there's any of that existing still, it would be at the National Archives. So you can check the NARA site or archives.gov and it'll, there's a link there that'll take you to the one for New England and see if they have any rolls of microfilm or things um, that might include Rhode Island arrivals. And if you find something that looks like it's interesting, then send them an email because they may actually even send you the document. I won't guarantee it, but they're doing everything they can, you know, to make up for the fact that you can't walk through their door. I have a question. Um, is there a reliable place to go to look for Canadian genealogy? I'm sorry, for Canadian what? 
for the um, genealogy for Canada. Um, Im people that immigrated from Canada into the U.S. Into the U.S. Okay, so no, are okay. we talking about French Canadian? No. English Canadian. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, because I know of two societies that both have libraries for French Canadian. Um, the emigration records, if they exist, would be in a set of records that's named for St. Albans, Vermont. And it doesn't mean that that's where they cross, but that's the name of the set of documents. So if there's a record of them coming in from Canada to the US, I would check that set of records first from St. Albans, Vermont, and you can, it should be at NARA. It may also be on Ancestry and Family Search. Um, one of the, see, one of the problems we run into is like England to Canada, that was not considered an emigration because it was the same country. So that was like, if somebody moves from Connecticut to Massachusetts, they don't necessarily create a record because they're in the same country. So, <coughs> excuse me, um, the same thing applies for England to Canada. Um, so I would look for, um, do you know whether they ever naturalized or not? They did Natural naturalize. Because naturalization papers might help you with some of the information on their emigration. I have a question. Sure, Bernice. Okay. I'm just wondering when you were talking about land records, how do you actually access land records? Uh, if they're from Massachusetts, the uh, website is called Mass Land. Wait, mm -hmm. no. Yeah, massland.com, I think. Um, you know what, Bernice? Email me your question and I'll email you back the exact link. But you'd think I could remember this, but I can only remember so many things some days. Um, <laughs> but it is a, it's, it's, organized by the state and then each section is run by the different registrar of deeds. Okay. So you have to have some idea of where the people were living in order to get the right registry. Okay. Um, but there's plenty of information there about looking it up by address, by name. Um, it depends a little on the date, how much of it is indexed. Okay. Thank you. I'll, I'll email you. Okay. Thank you. Right. Well, I want to thank you, Seema. This has really been wonderful. I've taken a lot of notes. <laughs> and if anyone hasn't received the handout, if you want to contact me, this is uh, Kathy Sebring. Send me an email and I can send you the PDF of the, uh, the pages that are in her handout. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Good thank luck, you. everybody. Thank, thank you, Seema. This was yeah. wonderful. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.